I already introduced Dr. Athena Manan to the, all the ideas. I think she should start the yeah. talk. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, is my slides are uh, visible? Yeah, yes. Man, yes, yes. Okay, I'm audible also. No? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, now uh, uh, we have two different topics. One is parasitic uveitis and another is intermediate uveitis. Uh, because we have quite a lot of pictures in parasitic uveitis, I selected that as a, a first choice. And uh, it's not moving. The parasitic uveitis will not be as obvious as we see in this picture. Many times we will be seeing this and we see the resident, we call the resident and we'll be excited to show this. By the time the resident looks into the slit lamp, this, this worm might have gone into the retrobal bar space. So it is highly motile and rarely we get to see such a clinical picture. It is very difficult to diagnose parasitic uveitis. And uh, in fact, I would say that if any uveitis, for that matter, if it is not fitting with the typical picture of uveitis, we have to rule out muscarid syndrome as well as parasitic uveitis. And that is very, very important. I will show you some of the uh, pictures which, you, which will make you think that it may not be very, very typical always. Before that, we will go to MBBS uh, class where our um, third year uh, uh, teachers were uh, talking about uh, protozoa and metasova. And the protozoa, toxoplasmosis, but we are not going to cover in this because that is a separate uh, subject by itself. In metasova, we have three things, nematode, cestode, and trematodes. Believe me, believe me, students, we have nematode infection in eye, cestrode infection in eye, trematode infection in eye. Uh, am, I not, am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Please continue, ma'am. Continue. Yeah, okay. So, for uh, nematode, we will have two examples. One is toxicara and reducen. We have quite a lot. I will be showing one by one. And in chest road, cysticercosis. That is a, uh, 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 I mean, uh, it is a tinea solium. And trematode proserum varium, which is recently uh, diagnosed and recently identified a disease. Uh, uh, if you see ocular, nematode is otherwise called round worms. Chest roads called tape worms. And trematodes are called flatworms. You will be interested to see some of the different type of nematodes in this presentation. So we are starting with roundworms or nematodes. In nematodes, you have ducin, where you, you do not know the name of the worm, but you see the structural damage done by the worm. The second one is dirophilariasis. I will show you a typical case. And uh, ganthostomiasis. Toxocariasis, onchocerciasis, loya loya. All those things are coming under nematodes. The problem with the diagnosis is we cannot do any blood test. We cannot do any serological test because the eye, a small structure, may have one small worm or larva and that may not have any antibodies relevant to the eye in the blood or serum. So whatever you get positive may not be relevant to the eye at all. And painfully, we don't have enough medicines. In parasitology, we have very few medicines and we are not really sure whether they will be killing the worm or not. I have a patient who had pinworm infestation for years and decades, decades she, till she died. So many times we have given uh, whatever anti-parasitic agents are available and she never got better. And I have seen few more patients. I used to think there are some genetically uh, weak patients always get this uh, pinworm and they can never get rid of it. And literature, do they help us? Not at all. 
because parasitic diseases are common only in developing poor countries and developed country literature doesn't talk about parasitology at all so literature doesn't help us so we have great challenge in handling parasitic diseases this is a best example of dusen you see the track marks beautiful track marks so under the retina it has traveled a long way and uh, structural damage it has caused so much but still we don't see a worm at all most probably if this is the site where the alive worm will be there because active retinal lesion is seen here but still we don't see the worm shape or anything like that because it is there in the subretinal space if it is above the retina we can see if it is in the vitreous we can see we have we have few videos uh, in aravind how the alive worms dance and, uh, somebody is not muted Uh, please mute dr mehar oh, yeah yeah okay. thank you uh, and uh, this is the, the, these are the structural changes how do we treat this patient we give albendazole for 14 days with steroids even though we are not seeing our enemy face to face albendazole 14 days with uh, steroids will definitely uh, get rid of the worm we need not to go behind with lasers because laser will further harm the retina and sometimes when we hit the worm with the laser this worm will jump here and we will be jumping with the laser here then here the end here so it is very very difficult to kill with laser instead you give albendazole and steroid and it will take care of everything we have beautiful cases where these worms were killed only with anti parasitic agent and to prevent any uh, allergic reaction or immunological reaction we also give low dose steroid for all these 15 days and this is gangastomiasis you see a st very stout worm very thick worm and you can even see the lumen inside and this robust thick worm is 1 uh, to 5 uh, mm it's very 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 small 1 to 5 mm and its thickness is invariably 600 mm and uh, this uh, worm can uh, cause again structural damage it can uh, penetrate the iris it can uh, damage the trabecular meshwork it can get into the eye it can do all sorts of harms and we have to kill the worm and uh, sometimes it will go and hide in the angle of the eye we have to see through the gonio lens so it is beautifully sleeping in the angle so and we need not to go and uh, do laser you give albendazole and steroid it will get killed on its own and the second worm is dyro dyrophilaria dyrophilaria is very very thin very thin worm and long worm it is 15 cm see here it is folded three times and still it is so long and sometimes and it, it is as thin as 150 micrometer which is one fourth of gangastomiasis and you can see a thin worm like this and males are smaller than females and we have to also understand as we grow uh, when we are children we are very small when we become adults we are uh, taller like that these worms also have varying life uh, uh, stages according to the stage the size of the worm will vary but definitely gangastomiasis worm is thicker and this is very thin and here also we need not to chase the worm with the needle and that will harm the patient patient's iris as well as lens the moment we enter with the needle it will go behind the iris invariably they go behind the iris we will we will not succeed instead we can give albendazole and steroids onchocerciasis we don't see in india at all only in africa and extensive courier retinal scars and uh, pale optic disc and both they will be blind and they will have cornea corneal uh, opacity as well and uh, the lower lower will be like this and even indian patients who have visited africa 7 to 10 years back may harbor one worm and when they come here after 7 to 10 years they may develop lower lower nodules so the past history has to be uh, really uh, important the past history has to be elicited properly
whether they have gone to African countries or South African, South American countries. And lower lower nodules uh, may have the worms and uh, ivermectin should not be given for ectoparasitic uh, conditions because if lower lower is there, they may develop anaphylactic reactions. So we have to be careful that they don't have lower lower in addition. And now we are coming to, we have finished nematodes. So many worms we have seen, uh, dirophilariasis, gandastomiasis, onchocerciasis, and lower lava. Now we are coming to chestrod or tapeworms. This you know pretty well. I'll, I'll give you a beautiful case. A very young child, beautiful child, came with hypopia nubiatus. Any of the students can give me differential diagnosis. A child with hypopion. Anybody want to give differential diagnosis? You uh, forget that this is parasitic uh, uh, class. Pragati, something else other than uveitis. If there is trauma, history of trauma, so then an end of the Wonderful. Wonderful. Anything else? A child with hypopion? Child. Yes. Child with hy uh, retinoblastoma. 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 Yes. Uh, in fact, when I received this child, I was very, very sad because she was looking beautiful. Only child of a very poor family. And uh, I thought it is retinoblastoma. And uh, what I did is, uh, I took, uh, I dilated the people and there was something floating like this. And there are so much of seeding. And now, uh, do you think of uh, retinoblastoma? No, I'm not. no it is still possible. Retinoblastoma that has come to the vitreous and all this seedling may be retinoblastoma seedling. Do you agree with me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So I, I almost thought it is only retinoblastoma. I wanted to do uh, uh, further investigation. So as you rightly mentioned, muscarate syndrome was the first diagnosis. Second was endogenous endophthalmitis. We did ultrasound. And ultrasound gave the diagnosis. It was cysticercosis, one cyst intact subretinally, another cyst ruptured, and it has caused so much reaction. So, a ruptured cysticercosis and with the intact cyst. And this intact cyst is the one that gave the diagnosis. So, we did vitrectomy and we removed all these debris and we removed this cyst intact. But unfortunately, in spite of everything, the patient I went for thysis because we, we often hear that ruptured cysticercosis can cause severe reaction. It caused severe reaction and then a patient was not seeing. So this is the way and it was cysticercosis. Luckily, it is not retinoblastoma, but still the child lost her vision. In the extreme periphery, there was a hole in the retina. Through that hole, there is a cyst has come into the vitreous. So this is the one example of chest roads. And uh, here we have to be extremely cautious because this child may have other uh, cysts in other areas, especially in the brain. So in order to see, we have to do neuroimaging also, about which we will see in the end of the class. Then comes the traumatoid. Traumatoid, many of you might not have uh, seen the uh, students uh, who live in uh, Thirunelveli of Tamil Nadu, Kaveri riverbed of Tamil Nadu, and in some Karnataka areas, and some Orissa packets, and students from Sri Lanka might have seen this traumatoid uh, cases. All others might not have seen. Uh, this is called a fluke or flatworm infection. This is quite common in South India, Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, Egypt, as well as in... Um, uh, Brazil. So it is internationally, it is seen, especially along the equator. And uh, you might have seen this uh, snail oriented uh, worms in your uh, Saturgy book in parasitology. Now we are showing, see, this is uh, this causes ascites, and this disease is common in uh, South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia, as I told you, in warmer climate. What we see in uh, Madurai, was a granuloma like this, say a solitary granuloma like this. In uh, at least a fifth, at some point of time, we had 
nearly 55% of our pediatric uveitis was just granuloma. It was so common. Now it is not that common because we have controlled it. And uh, this is mainly seen along the east coastal area of Tamil Nadu. And wherever this Kaveri River flows in Tamil Nadu, we have this disease. And also in some of the districts of Kerala, Malapram and some of the uh, specific districts of Kerala we see also in Sri Lanka. And this nodule either look like a subconjunctival nodule or anterior chamber granuloma. So we uh, excised these nodules and we collaborated with Dr. Narsingya Rao, a pathologist, world-renowned pathologist and also a parasitologist. And luckily to our surprise, this came as a traumatoid granuloma. And after that, we, we read a lot of uh, so, uh, zoology books and uh, we learned that this is uh, the larva and this larva, uh, egg, uh, adult worms live in birds and they uh, lay eggs in the contaminated water here and first larva come out and it affects the snails, specifically melanoid tuberculoma, tuberculoma slides, snails and then second larva comes. This is supposed to affect the bird eye, but unfortunately, these children take bath without any protection in the contaminated water and they get the granuloma. And uh, this granuloma can cause blindness in South Indian children. So, Sertaria, what we did is we did a wonderful uh, research uh, and uh, we collected these snails, we collected this Sertaria, we did RT-PCR and we did um, real-time PCR also and uh, we did blast analysis and sequencing as well as the granulomas from the children. We, we took this sample as well as environmental sample and then the blast analysis showed us the result that it is Proserbum varium, which is a traumatode. And this we published in American Journal of Ophthalmology and American Academy publication Ophthalmology and Archives of Ophthalmology. Uh, long back, 2002, 1 and 2012. And now we are not giving any, this uh, particular uh, disease was diagnosed as tuberculosis in Tamil Nadu and a lot of students were uh, receiving anti-tubercular treatment. Now we are not treating with anti-TB. Uh, anybody wants to say anything? Okay, okay. okay. Um, so now the, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the problems in uh, parasitic aviators. As I told you, diagnosis is a problem. Not every time cystocircosis will be having a beautiful cyst with the scolex. It may present like a very rare presentation and the serology will not help us. And if we think of management, added nearest neuro cystocircosis, as I told you, patient may have, when you start only albendazole, they may have cerebral edema, so which is not safe for the patient. So we have to work with the neuro, a neurologist and the neuroimaging. If there is no neurocysticircosis, then we can treat with albendazole. And literature, unfortunately, many of the books say white image like America, but unfortunately, this white uh, color is because of lack of literature. Even in Africa, they have literature. Even in Brazil, they have literature. In uh, Many of us do not publish parasitic diseases. So the map is white as if we don't have a parasite. Literature, we have to build. Whenever we see parasitic disease, we have to work on that and publish so that we will know the real picture. When there is no literature, there is no research in developing countries. Unless we prove, unless we uh, publish, there won't be any research, there won't be any good medicine also. So we have to learn a lot in parasitic disease and uh, this is only outline in parasitic disease. And uh, one most, most important message to our students, all these worms are accidental, uh, human play as accidental hosts. So by examining motion, motion test, we will not come to any diagnosis. They are accidental host. 
so one one or two larva will be in our body and that will settle in one of the end organs and it will die and patient may not have any evidence only in the eye because we we have transparent structures we are seeing them as uh, dancing worms but motion test will not help us that is the reason we are not able to prove in many cases we are not able to uh, take the worm intact if it is in ac you put the needle it will go behind and uh, you hit with the laser subretinal space you cannot go and take the worm out so because we are not able to get the worm and the motion test will be negative serology tests are not helping that is the reason we don't have evidence to publish but with foot, good photograph and good literature review we have to publish i uh, hope you understand and uh, now we, uh, because the time is uh, going up i i'll start with intermediate uveitis so can you uh, tell the dose and duration of albendazole treatment yeah so that is, is the uh, key for uh, parasitic diseases yeah the i told everyone should know about it yeah i told in uh, middle of my uh, lecture that it is 400 mg uh, once a day for 14 days with 20 mg steroid in every day for a week 10 mg steroid every day for a week because any worm when they get killed they will develop a little uveitis uh, so patient may become symptomatic after we start the uh, tablet so we have to give steroid in addition okay yeah uh, ratna ma'am one question yeah. for yeah. the yeah. benefit of the students yeah yeah what would be the five most clinching signs in a patient when you would suspect a parasitic uveitis yeah as i told you in the first slide whenever i have a atypical presentation which is not fitting with our own uh, uh, known entities i always include muskrat syndrome and parasitic disease in differential diagnosis yen uh, because the toxicara which i just mentioned but i don't show i didn't show you the picture it will be just a white color granuloma in the vitreous which we may uh, mistake it for uh, retinoblastoma which we may uh, mistake it for tubercular granuloma or sarcoid granuloma so anything atypical we have to have first thing uh, muscarid and the second thing as parasitic other than our anatomical diagnosis second thing as in duson if there is a tract lesion in the fundus definitely i suspect and i take them to the fundus camera i see the i i take the montage photograph in the magnified view i really look for any worm any small hook like worm repeatedly i i attribute to one student or fellow to search every field so that is second third one is why i had one another very interesting patient right eye preceptal cellulitis a male patient 40 i mean male patient 40 years old and there is no reason for him to have uh, peri preceptal cellulitis so just we gave some anti allergic drug and we asked him to come for uh, follow up he came with a second eye preceptal cellulitis uh, with itching uh, somehow it was not fitting with anything you know preceptal cellulitis is common in children so i had an idea whether he has any parasitic disease i asked the student to dilate the fundus and look for it and we have recently published that also that is not presented in this uh, picture there is a beautiful s shaped worm in the subretinal space so unusual allergic reaction i suspect uh, parasitic lesion and uh, uh, as we as i told you the fourth sign is we will be seeing dancing uh, worms in the anterior segment and uh, a student will be very much excited will bring the case to us and it will not be seen then we we may we cannot discharge that patient telling that nothing is seen Pro probably she has seen and it has moved backwards so we make the patient wait and see again and the fifth point is i have to add about the ectoparasites ectoparasites are parasites that are living in the lid margins uh, many of you might have uh, seen um, uh, demodex demodex worm uh, which is which has a eight legged claws and which will be clinking on to the eyelashes 
and uh, worm will not be seen at all because it will be in the hair pit but still it will cause severe itching and patient will have specifically itching over the lid margin and if we plug one eyelash and put it in oil immersion uh, uh, microscope and see we can beautifully demonstrate demodex and uh, that is one one sort of uh, ectoparasite the another sort of extra ectoparasite is general complaint is itching and if you see the conjunctival cul-de-sac you can see astrus ovis which is which will beautifully move throughout the conjunctiva and those is those uh, worms are common in people who have cattle at home a cattle mouse will have lot of worms and when it sneezes it comes to our eyes or when they present in the dust when we sweep the floor in the road side we may get uh, uh, astrus ovis in our eyes so whenever patient gives history of itching don't neglect see the eye uh, carefully and if you remove one astrus ovis patient will worship you so these are uh, five signs itching is important and hair follicle uh, demodex is important and track signs are important and if somebody says some worm i have seen and we don't see definitely it has gone behind and sometimes they make iris holes or uh, they will be hide in the angle of the iris so these are all the points only uh, uh, only point here is very very careful clinical examination even for a, a sometimes you no know, when 40 year old lady comes or 60 year old lady comes when she says itching we are likely to send them with some eye drops olopet or something like that no let us imagine that she has parasitic let us search for a parasitic instead of thinking that she may not have anything Have I answered your question? Yeah, thank you so much, okay. ma'am. Can we can we include uh, iris holes without any history of uh, trauma? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah, I I have beautiful case. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I have a beautiful case where uh, I saw twenty iris holes, and still mm. the worm was in the eye. So we gave uh, uh, albendazole and we killed the worm. And I was I used to say that this foolish worm. did not see a pupil which is very big it has not come through the pupil but it made 20 holes in the iris <laughs> i wish i had that photograph here yes. and uh, that is in another presentation thank you thank, thank you ma'am i think you really simplified uh, by telling us all those signs though it's a very complex topic i know yeah but it is very interesting once you see one parasite you will be all unit will be thrilled okay so now intermediate weight is is also a gray zone for uh, students uh, they always have doubt whether to say intermediate weight is or anterior weight is but there are very very few very important points students should remember either for examination or for their prior practice i will definitely include those important points and uh, sun nomenclature uh, group has given us a very very clear definition vitreous is the major site of inflammation here and the presence of peripheral vascular sheathing and macular edema will be there and just because macular edema is there we cannot call it as panuviatus this is a structural damage of this intermediate uveitis you will be seeing uveitis or inflammatory cell more in this zone intermediate zone you may have some spillover inflammation here and you may have macular edema but this vitreous will be clear uh, the more number of intermediate uveitis c cases you see you will not have any doubt it will be very very clearly shown uh, that this inflammation is localized here predominant localization in the intermediate zone and this zone is very important because you have ciliary body you have lens so the chronic inflammation in the ciliary body can make the ciliary body go into atrophy and detachment which is a very common very 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 common complication in children intermediate uveitis so once ciliary atrophy happens i will go for thysis and your lens is right at in the intermediate zone so most common complication is cataract can we remove the cataract 
unless we control the inflammation we never catch the cataract i will show you during the course of the class and uh, as i told you sun nomenclature says that intermediate is, is the inflammatory evidence is seen in vitreous vitreous is a avascular structure it cannot produce inflammation but all inflammatory cells are loaded in the vitreous and it is also called uh, pars planitis some old literature called posterior cyclitis and hyalitis but now we are supposed to call this as only as intermediate vitreous these things are now not in uh, use at all and uh, what is the difference between intermediate vitreous and pars planitis is most common question we hear from students see here you see the snow banking it is exactly like your white coat there is a white coat of uh, deposit in the sparse plana only when you see such white snow banking you call it as sparse planitis and it will not indicate any disease it is idiopathic sparse planitis idiopathic intermediate uveitis with snow banking is sparse planitis you can either have snow bank or snow ball formation which i will show you here and in india uh, we have 10 to 17% of the people suffering from uh, out of in a uveitis clinic it forms 10 to 20% and it is seen bilaterally up to 90% of the patients it occurs both in uh, children as well as in adult there is no definite gender predilection when it affects the children it really 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 bothers them to control intermediate uveitis in children and it is extremely important to rule out tuberculosis because we will be putting these patients on definitely immunosuppressives before starting immunosuppressive we have to rule out tuberculosis and this often causes vancreatopathy and ring synecia and cataract white uveitis exactly like juvenile idiopathic arthritis associated uveitis the only problem here is exactly like ja associated uveitis this can also be a asymptomatic disease in children and dense vitreous cells and patient will not be knowing that they have defective vision only on screening examination or accidental examination we come to know about this in children and by the time the cataract will be there ciliary atrophy will be there and the macular edema will be there opaque vitreous will be there it is very difficult so after ruling out um, tuberculosis we have to be really really hard in treating and patients with intermediate uveitis present with minimum symptom if at all if they have uh, floaters they may say floaters and blurred vision only when vitreous become opaque in severe cases they present with vision loss total vision loss at that time it is very difficult to handle and uh, most of the time defective vision is because of macular edema and uh, you know the problem of macular edema in children i will i will come to know i will come to that slide little later and according to our uh, neusen blot classification they may have zero cells or may have three cells where you will be seeing even nerve fiber layer in one plus you will not see nerve fiber layer in 2 plus even the vessels are seen faintly in 3 plus you will not you will see the disc faintly in 4 plus you will not see anything so all these things are seen in intermediate uveitis of any age and snowballs look like this and most of the time when you have snowballs like this it is it could be because of sarcoid and when you have retinal granulomas as well as pigmented scars in pars planitis we have to rule out tuberculosis sarcoid never causes pigmentary changes tuberculosis always causes pigmentary changes and uh, tortuosity of vessels and sheathing this is extremely important in a case of intermediate uveitis in children you may be giving uh, immunosuppressive for 4 years 5 years and fundus may look absolutely normal and 66 x vision you will think that we can stop immunosuppressive once you stop immunosuppressive uveitis will come back immediately with the forcible uh, reaction and the patient may lose vision so it is better always we do ffa and if ffa is not showing vasculitis it is time to taper immunosuppressive even if the patient is on 6 years of immunosuppression 
if the, if there is vasculitis don't stop be very very careful yeah in fact the ffa should be done every year whether patient is uh, symptomatic or not every year we have to see we have to take care of these patients till they become 16 or 18 years of age because vascular occlusion is common and neovascularization is common once they have neovascularization invariably they bleed then retinal traction and detachment and kyses i am not threatening you intermediate vitis in children is a blinding disease we have to be very careful and they can develop glaucoma cataract macular edema neovascularization and vasculitis is the most important one and bsk in children is a headache you we should not remove bsk unless they become 16 years of age because once you remove it will come again you remove it come again then cornea becomes too thin so we will live with the patient we educate the patient that we have to live with the defective vision but control inflammation and take them to 16 years then we will plan for any surgical correction and uh, as i told you tb syphilis sarcoid very very common causes and idiopathic in 70% of the cases in this cases we once we rule out tb we can give immunosuppressive i have quite a lot of children with intermediate tb it is on uh, either methotrexate or mmf or adalimab or uh, cycle even cyclophosphamide uh, people who cannot afford adalimab i even give cyclophosphamide it is very very difficult to treat and ffa and oct are our boon so if patient can afford every visit we can do ffa a uh, sorry sorry oct and once in a year definitely we have to do ffa intermediate vitis is, is a gray zone we think it is a easy disease it is a very difficult disease in children adult it is easy to manage like uh, yeah i'll i'll finish now sir i am coming to the end and uh, treatment option is a step ladder pattern we start with oral steroid and uh, if the cystic macular edema is there we have to go for periocular steroid and uh, always think about glaucoma in children bondo thank you just two someone, minutes someone else is uh, this thing you need not worry we have time okay okay okay, okay don't thank worry. you <laughs> thank you uh, uh, thank you so much sayed uh, can you stop uh, dr mehar's um, uh, audio there is a lot of disturbance is coming from there uh, madam we continue time is not a uh, continue okay. please okay uh, so, so oral steroid is extremely important to start with and if the cystic macular edema is there it is not only periocular steroid but we may need uh, intravitreal steroid or osirudex and by chance if they have neovascularization definitely they need um, uh, osirudex and then comes the immunosuppressive immunosuppressive as i told you we have to have all immunosuppressive available to us like uh, acetaprin uh, methotrexate mmf and cyclophosphamide <coughs> and some of my uh, children are on adalimab wonderful drug uh, only thing extremely expensive the children who are on adalimab they never develop bsk they never never develop uh, cataract they never develop uh, cyclidic membrane they never develop uh, ciliary atrophy and uh, surgical intervention is uh, extremely challenging in these cases it is better we do surgical intervention only when they become 16 years but by chance if a younger child is having totally opaque vitreous vitrectomy can be done vitrectomy with osirudex can be done but cataract uh, has to be has to be delayed by 16 years because once we do cataract if there is a recurrent inflammation the cyclidic membrane will get attached to the lens and it will pull down the lens invariably lens get dislocated and cyclidic membrane will be very dense when it pulls the ciliary body it causes ciliary detachment so uh, some people will always say that anterior vitrectomy and lens even that is better anterior vitrectomy can be done by the retina surgeon and then anterior segment surgeon will do the cataract surgery keeping the posterior capsule intact 
we do some we do have done some of the cases like that anterior vitrectomy by a retina surgeon and uh, cataract iol by the iol surgeon because these children will also go for amblyopia when there is cataract uh, we may say that we have to delay till 16 years but 16 uh, by 16 years if she develops amblyopia we totally fail so what i mean to say is if they have vision if they can manage we will control inflammation and delay the surgery if they don't have vision we we pour down all the immunosuppressive control the disease and with uh, real caution we have to do vitrectomy cataract removal and leave the patient aphakic uh, give aphakia glasses and make them not to go into amblyopia then later date we can put eye oil so it is slip bladder uh, technique and nowadays nobody does uh, cryo or nobody does laser unless they have neovascularization when they have neovascularization definitely we do pan retinal photocoagulation so this is about uh, intermediate vitis and the steroid we usually give 1 mg per kg body weight most of the children are uh, 40 kg adults are 60 kg then we slowly taper and we give only 20 mg tricot and if needed we give more intravitreal um, steroid either intravitreal steroid which is uh, preservative free which comes from aro lab or osrodex depending upon patient's paying capacity but in vitrectomized eyes only osrodex can be given because uh, your vitre in, there is no vitreous this intravitreal triamcinolone acetate will get absorbed immediately it will not be available for the treatment so osrodex is definitely needed and as i told you already all immunosuppressives are uh, used in these children and uh, of course we have to do blood blood investigation once in two months and we have very successfully treated intermediate vitis cases as well and very poorly treated and uh, gone for thysical eye we do have and especially i always want to say about one boy unfortunate muslim boy uh, who was on mmf for uh, at least 5 years and uh, inflammation was under control he was seeing very well uh, but uh, for 6 months there was no recurrence at all and they were very poor so they were begging me to stop the drug because they were not able to support the child more than 5 years i thought okay it is more than 6 months not even single cell i stopped it and immediately intermediate it is came back and he became blind in both eyes and uh, even parents are very very guilty for asking me to stop i am extremely guilty that i stopped so these children uh, behave in a worst way intermediate it is in children uh, we have to be very very cautious and surgical intervention as i told you partial plana vitrectomy or cataract surgery uh, some of the cases of cyclotic membrane uh, partial plana membranectomy has been done in some of our cases uh, it is it is challenging but some of the very good surgeons no they handle it so well they do vitrectomy they do partial plana membranectomy they do small hole in the posterior capsule and then they give the patient to the anterior segment surgeon who will put the eye oil after removing cataract so it has to be specialized to treatment so this is about uh, intermediate vitis uh, i can take up any question thank you very much madam it was a wonderful talk as usual uh, so there was somebody who was asking me the like uh, montuk test in case of children uh, mm. how how sensitive is it uh, actually even though we say that they are given bcg uh, in my experience many children show negative manto also and when they have negative manto it means two things one is they are immunologically weak even bcg has not mounted any immunological reaction it is something like anergy in lepromatous leprosy so these children are more prone for tuberculosis and one another explanation is because we give bcg unfortunately on day 1 after birth the immunological system of the child is not a good enough to handle that is the reason most of the children are still 
matter negative. Uh, uh, textbooks say that Indian children will be always positive. It doesn't happen like that. Many of them negative also. Just because they are negative, we cannot say that they are not having tuberculosis. We have to have extreme thorough checkup for peripheral lymphadenopathy and uh, any scar because of a ruptured uh, fold abscess or CT scan and ultrasound abdomen. And even the inguinal node may have tuberculosis sometimes. So thorough examination, systemic examination and radiological examination is needed. Uh, Mantu alone is not enough at all. But if Mantu is hyper positive, more than 15 millimeter in children, it is extremely indicative of tuberculosis. Uh, Ratina, ma'am, there is another question for you that can we find acute signs of anterior segment such as circumcorneal congestion in intermediate uveitis and whether it is rare or not found? Very rare. Very, 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 very rare. Uh, in sarcoid uh, intermediate uveitis, we can have mutton fat keratic precipitates and uh, circumcorneal congestion. A typical idiopathic intermediate uveitis is white eye uveitis, often. And ma'am, could you explain a little more regarding the oral steroid therapy that how do you taper it and when do you add the immunosuppressant in a case of intermediate uveitis and for how long would you continue immunosuppression? Yes, I first month I give only steroid. And uh, this is to learn about the patient as well as the parents. Because invariably parents will be having lot of doubt on us. They always think that we unnecessarily treat their precious children. So when you start immunosuppressive on first visit, they run away from you because we have to counsel them. And uh, when our counselor says the adverse reaction, they run away, run away and they always blame that uh, the bigger institute start big medicine and we don't need anything. And I is white and child is not complaining and we can go to village healer. So what I do is I give low dose steroid and uh, I gain their confidence. I'll tell them that I'm giving very low dose. We will let us see what happens. Only when it is needed, I will increase. I know 100% in my mind that I will be increasing, but I will say that only when it is needed, I will increase. So let us first see and then I show the FFA, normal FFA as well as the leaking vessels of their uh, uh, child FFA. And I'll tell them the blood vessels are we leaking. So you should know the seriousness. And I will also say that we both will be, uh, will have to be in contact and collaboration to save your child till she becomes 16 years. So even in the first visit, I'll make it very, very clear that this is a serious disease. I, you have to meet me till she becomes 16 or 18, but I will give low dose steroids. And they will come with the same symptom. Nothing would have happened because you are giving after all 20 milligram. Then I know that they are committed to me. They will come. Then I increase the dose according to weight, uh, body weight. And I tell them second, the most important thing is pushing guide. Uh, definitely like, uh, unfortunately, I always use Jayalalitha as my uh, uh, example because uh, Tamil Nadu people love, the, love her. So I will tell her, even our Jayalalitha had steroid side effects. So, and I, I started, I had a steroid dose many times. So, I, I used to say, I was taking steroid. I was also very, uh, uh, very much, uh, I mean, stout. Um, we don't bother about being stout, but we are worried about vision. Then I give full course of steroid. Then they come to me. Only when they come to me again, I know that they have confidence in me. Then I start immunosuppressive. I tell them we can, we have to avoid steroids because your child is putting on weight. So I will uh, go to steroid sparing drug. Then they will know, okay, we are going one step after another. Then third visit, I start immunosuppressive definitely. And for how long, ma'am? Uh, it's more than uh, five years, six years, depending upon the uh, uh, inflammation. And absolutely, when there is no vascular leakage for one year, I stop. So, which is your favorite immunosuppressant? Uh, uh, because we have quite a lot of experience. The Western world had used the tablet for more than 40 years. And um, uh, if at all, if the child has liver function problem, then I go for acetoprine. 
but uh, i i really don't like asatheprin because it is very weak uh, methotrexate then i go for mmf some patients are on methotrexate and mmf uh, when we add these two in lower dose we can add methotrexate 15 mg and uh, mmf according to the body weight either 250 mg bd or 500 bd because mmf acts only for 12 hours so if if you treat with mmf it has to be bd dose so we have to tell the patient that it will uh, exactly work for 12 hours then they understand and they cooperate with this with the double dose and steroid most of the time the inflammation will come under control and uh, with maybe we may need avastin we may need intravitreal steroid we may need periocular steroid all those things in between whenever there is a flare up and, and one more question yeah sure i'll just ask one small thing that in a child would you always start with subcutaneous methotrexate or you yeah you subcutaneous is very very good because bioavailability is good but only thing if it is they are from village they have to search for a doctor for subcutaneous if they are educated i teach them because uh, I, i teach them in my own clinic how i inject and uh, they they uh, just pick up that if they don't have any support unfortunately we have to rely on tablets and the only side effect in uh, methotrexate one in 100 uh, 10 patients out of 100 10% of the patients will have extreme fatigue on the day they take the tablet extreme fatigue in the sense they cannot get up from the bed so i tell them uh, 10% of them can have this uh, side effect but to take the tablet at saturday night all sunday you take rest and monday you will be back to home back to work so uh, that is very small number of patients but it do occur definitely madam in those cases where there is a spillover anterior uveitis how do you differentiate that from intermediate uveitis uh, see the amount of inflammation will be more in the behind the lens than in the anterior segment but when they are on topical steroid sometimes uh, it it will uh, definitely confuse us but nowadays people uh, even drug com- drug trial people agree that intermediate uveitis can have anterior segment component which is significantly uh, active so you the uh, only thing is you have to add topical steroid if there is no anterior segment inflammation no topical steroid because we don't want to make the patient glaucomatous but if the patient has spillover you see that you are giving homoid always even if there is no posterior sinicae on saturday they can apply one drop homoid so it, they will not have any sinicae they will have uh, active mobile people once in a week is enough ma'am can you ask the some posterior students yeah. what they have understood till the, till now yeah yeah I think we should ask the students. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Ma'am, one question. Uh, mm-hmm. Right now, you said we should uh, start with homide, ma'am. What mm-hmm. is your choice of cycloplegic? Should it be atropin or homatropin? Homide. At least why? theoretically, people say that cyclophosphamide can cause chemical iritis. I don't have experience, but because books mention like that. i always use homoid i never use atropin in children because it will cause fully dilated people and sinicae in fully dilated uh, situation that is very 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 cumbersome you know, they cannot see the light at all so i always use homoid and atropin i use only in my opd only for hla b27 uveitis i apply once that's all i never prescribe thank you ma'am any other questions from the pg students and for the benefit of the students can you tell uh, what are the side effects of each of these uh, medications that i that they they are going to use and uh, what are the blood tests that should, they should regularly be doing if yes. they using yeah in methotrexate say it is a liver toxic so all all the immunosuppressive tcdc hemoglobin platelet count is a must because any of them can cause aplastic anemia 
So TCDC hemoglobin platelet count is extremely important in every immunosuppressive. Whereas in methotrexate, in addition, liver function test. And uh, MMF usually very, very safe. But again, may, uh, at least once in four months, we have to have liver function test. In case of azathioprine, uh, thrombocytopenia is very common. So TCDC, platelet count, hemoglobin. That is very important. Liver is usually not affected in azathioprine. Methotrexate and MMF liver function test. And in cyclophosphamide, aplastic anemia is very, very common. And uh, uh, always check urine for RBCs because we, they can have hemorrhagic cystitis. But uh, usually cyclophosphamide I give only for six months. Within six months, CVHS will come absolutely under control. Even though it is a very toxic drug, it is a wonderful drug. Dr. Pragati, you want to ask something? Yeah, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Yes, yeah. sir. Ma'am, I, um, I basically wanted to ask how, uh, when do we start tapering the dose of steroid? Uh, in the first visit, you said that till, in the first visit, you start a low dose steroid, then till the second visit, you increase the dosage. And then in the third, you start the immunosuppressants. Mm. So uh, tapering the steroids would begin after we've added the... Uh, uh, only after inflammatory control. Uh, I taper. Uh, uh, at least I keep them on uh, 10 milligram every day for one month, then 10 milligram on alternate day for a few more months. Then when uh, nothing happens, when there is no VAEs at all, I make it 7.5 milligram alternate day, 5 milligram alternate day, 2.5 milligram alternate day, and I keep them on 2.5 milligram alternate day forever till I stop immunosuppressive. And even today, one patient on 2.5 milligram, uh, on two days a week, I was giving. He was a weak age patient on methotrexate and adalimab. 90 injection has been given, and uh, everything was absolutely under control. Uh, he is coming to me for past uh, two and a half years, no, three years before COVID he came. And uh, now I wanted to stop the 2.5 milligram, which is given just two days a week he has recurrence. So that 2.5 milligrams uh, steroid was holding everything. Unfortunately, uh, now again, I have started steroids in that patient. So 2.5, I never stop. Thank you, ma'am. So when you are starting the immunosuppressants, ma'am, in a patient where you have started initially steroids, would it what dose of steroid would you add immunosuppression or would it be that once you've completely come to a level less than 10 mg would be when you're going to be adding immunosuppression no not at all because all this uh, methotrexate asorin as well as mmf take at least one to two months to uh, really act so when they are on 40 milligram i start immunosuppressive by the time you taper uh, these tablets will take over so I don't wait for the steroid to come down and then start this. I think that's something very important for the uveitis patients. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me, ma'am. Ma'am, mm -hmm. uh, what will be your take on uh, a necrotic mantle mm -hmm. without any other evidence of TV? Like yeah, nothing on. Is, yeah, if it is necrotic mantle, I am very, very careful uh, if I had to start immunosuppressive. Uh, there will be a situation. Everything will be under control with steroid and when you taper steroid, it comes back again. It can be very well TB or it can be very well autoimmune. Uh, my question is, why don't you think of ATT trial rather than think of immunosuppressive? ATT trial, within two months, you will know the result. And by chance, we miss a case of tuberculosis and give immunosuppressive. And if the child becomes miliary tuberculosis, then we cannot forgive ourselves. So necrotic mandu, definitely I give ATT trial rather than immunosuppressive. So ma'am, you're suggesting that uh, of, with a necrotic mandu, ATT trial is a good option. Yes, to begin yes, with. yes. Definitely, yes. definitely. Because oh. see, you may have 
I have tubercular epididymitis, tubercular salpingitis, real cases, tubercular mesenteric lymphadenitis, paraiotic lymphadenitis, omental tuberculosis, peritoneal tuberculosis, pericardial tuberculosis, pleurisy, and uh, intracranial tuberculosis, and tubercular sinusitis, tubercular lacrimal gland, so, uh, and tubercular osteoarthritis of a particular bone, biopsy proven, whatever I say is, all these things are biopsy proven. Uh, because we have nearly 80,000 cases in this 30 years, uh, I have quite a lot of tuberculosis cases with the extra pulmonary tuberculosis. Our uh, screening system cannot uh, screen every place of the body. Um, I had a doubt. Uh, mm. How confidently can we rule out tuberculosis uh, with a man test? If it's coming out to be negative, how confident no, never, can we... Never, never, never. It is only the clinical picture. Clinical picture and ocular picture. man is only a supportive evidence. And uh, by chance, if man is negative and patient may have even pulmonary cavity, I have a patient with a bilateral pulmonary cavity with a negative mantle. That's what I was telling. He is allergic to mycobacterium tubercular antigen and he developed a very severe form of tuberculosis. And uh, so mantle can, uh, you can only explain the mantle, why it is negative, why it is positive, uh, but it is a very tricky test. So, ma'am, whenever working up such patients of uveitis, we yes. definitely need to rule out rule this particular tub tuberculosis out. So, just having a negative man to is sufficient or should we, based upon our clinical judgment, should we... Clinical judgment and your CT scan. I know CT scan is harmful than uh, X-ray, but uh, I think uh, making a patient miliary tuberculosis is more harmful. Dr. Sarmista, would you like to have some comments? Yes, sir. Yeah. In our institute also, we uh, it is up to the clinician to decide when to start the ATT. We come across a number of cases and like ma'am said, we try with ATT and then if it's not responding, we switch over to, uh, usually we use methotrexate, sir. Polytrust yeah. 15 milligram uh, once weekly is uh, what is given. Right. For the Absolutely right. And along with it, we give folic acid 5 milligram, except uh, on the day when, when the methotrexate is given. And that is to continue for uh, six months or so. Uh, you can safely give till two years, no problem. Yes. Only cyclophosphamide has to be uh, reduced by six months. All other uh, immunosuppressive, you are safe for two years. Two years. And yes, ma'am, we also do FP <laughs> intermittently. Mm. Which one? Uh, LFT. LFT. LFT, definitely. Once in two months or three months. Okay. I think uh, now it's time to end up. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, yeah. you have a really extensive discussion. Uh, before, before I offer the uh, vote of thanks.